Okay, you're good. All right, I'm going to try to speak up so that if you have any trouble hearing me, just let me know. Um, and the audio may be a little bit of a learning curve, so just keep that in mind as we go through this. Go through this. So um, I've got my phone with me because I may need to play some audio from here, just so you know. It's, it's, it's kind of weird to be on my phone while I'm giving a talk. Um, but I'm going to talk about the cicadas of Illinois. Um, I've been working on cicadas in Illinois since about 2015. Um, and uh, I've learned a few things over um, those past few years. Um, and I'm going to kind of take you on a tour through the audio landscape of Illinois. Um, now, cicadas are a little bit difficult of an organism to research. Um, and that's because they spend a lot of time underground. Um, and when I was preparing for this talk, um, I came across this uh, quote from um, Beamer from the 1920s. Um, and I, I reference his work quite a bit. Um, he was at Kansas. Um, and he says that in spite of the fact that cicadas have been known and written about since medieval times, um, very little is known about their life histories. Um, this lack is doubtless due in part um, in large measure to their habit of passing the entire nymphal stage below the surface of ground. And because in most cases, this period is supposed to last from several to many years. Members of some Kansas species emerge in large numbers every year, a constant challenge to one so inclined to solve the secret of their life cycle. Um, so I'm gonna tell you what we do know about their life cycle. Um, so starting from eggs. So um, this is a magic cicada, um, a periodical cicada, and she's got her ovipositor in this branch right here. So she's pumping eggs into this twig, um, and they really pack those eggs in there tight. So if you actually dissect um, one of these twigs, you'll see they're really, really lined. It's kind of hard to see in this picture, but they're lined up in there. And they look kind of like grains of rice. Um, so some species will lay in twigs, most species do. Some lay under bark. Um, and then a couple, which I'll talk about later, lay in grass stems. So. Um, once those eggs hatch, those little tiny nymphs, so smaller than a grain of rice, they fall to the ground um, and they burrow into the soil. Um, and this is where most of the mortality happens. This is where most of the cicadas die off. Once they're in the ground, um, they find a plant root and they build a little burrow around that plant root. Um, and they'll stay on that plant root or maybe move around a little bit underground, we don't know, um, and grow and grow and grow until they um, go through about five different instars. So that means they've shed their exoskeleton, they've shed their skin five times to get bigger. Um, what's really interesting is that underground, they're feeding on plant xylem. And plant xylem is a very, very low nutrient source food. So they actually need bacterial endosymbionts that live in their gut to produce some of those amino acids that is not present in the plant juices that they're feeding on. So they spend a number of years underground before they come above ground. Um, and I was proud of this. I, I actually dug up this nymph um, from the Chusa grasslands. Uh, this is Megatibison olides. Um, and it was, it was pretty large. <laughs> um, but it looks really alien. It looks very different than what we're used to seeing. Um, and it was actually really hard to find. So, uh, some of the cicada researchers say that um, you just need to dig, you know, about 11 inches below the um, soil surface, and you can find these everywhere. Um, after many, many, many hours of trying, <laughs> I was successful in finding this individual, which I thought was really awesome to find. Um, but it is a little bit more difficult than some other labs might say it is. Um, and so once they go um, above ground, you might see, oh, let's see, yeah, there's, there's an example of a nymph that's crawling up out of the ground. Hopefully some of you have been able to find some of these guys in the past. Um, this is a walker cicada that I found up in Salem. Um, and, you know, this is a magic cicada coming right out of that hole in the ground. Um, and so this is what you might be more familiar with. Now, most of the time, these guys are coming out of the ground in the evenings. Um, because they don't want to get eaten by birds. They're a large food source for birds. Um, but sometimes you can find them in the morning. Their timing's just a little off. Um, and so the adults, when you find them, um, 
they have what we call a proboscis, and it's like a straw-like mouth part. And so they're going to stick that into plants to drink juices. Um, and so adults feed, and they're above ground for a couple weeks usually, um, sometimes up to three to four weeks. Um, and males are the ones that sing. So females can't sing. They don't have the noise-producing organs. So these right here, this is where the noise-producing organs are. They're called timbles. Um, and they're actually underneath this. So this is called an operculum, and the, the timbles are underneath that. Um, and I had um, some of the entomology classes on campus ask me for some cicadas for dissection. Um, and I gave them a few males, and they said, it's really weird, we open these up and it's just empty inside. And so the abdomen is almost completely empty because it's a resonant chamber. So it's kind of a way to amplify the noise that they're making. Um, the timbals that they use are actually kind of like drums in the way that they function. Um, and each male song is different uh, to a certain degree. There's, there's some that are really close, um, but most of the time they're, they're different. But you can tell a male from a female, again, by those, those noise producing organs. And the female here, she has an ovipositor. So um, what I do is I go out in the field um, and I set up some recorders so that I can monitor when species start calling and I have these across the state um, and so these will record at all daylight hours um, and they record daily um, and I have to re you know change the batteries every um, month or so but I also record um, with this thing on top, I record the light intensity because light matters for when cicadas are going to call. Cicadas don't typically call when it's raining or cold, so we measure the temperature as well. Um, and so we go out and we pick up these recorder um, SD cards every, every month and we change out the batteries. Um, and you know, I also record when I see individuals. Um, and you can see that different species have different periods of activity. Um, and so some of these species are really early season. I didn't put the periodical cicadas, so those, those black and orange guys, and those are going to be in early, or late May to early June. So those come out very, very first. Um, whereas these other species, they, some are really, really just, you know, um, have a much shorter period of activity. Um, and so you really have to time when you go out to look for these guys very carefully because sometimes you can miss them. Um, and it's happened, and then you have to wait a whole nother year to find them. Um, this species here in blue, this is the eastern site scissor grinder cicada, and I'll play you their call later, um, but you'll be very familiar with that one. That's one of our most common dog day cicadas in Illinois. So, um, most insects, when we think of them, they have either one life cycle, so going from egg to adult and back to egg again, right? Um, one life cycle per year, so that's called univoltine. Some insects actually have multiple generations in a year, right? So they lay their eggs and um, have adult different, uh, different generations throughout one year. Um, whereas cicadas are semi-voltine, so meaning that they are underground for many years, and so it takes a long time to go from egg to adult. Um, and this varies quite a bit, anywhere from one to 21 years underground. Um, and somebody actually did compile the species that we do know. Don't worry too much about this, but what you'll see is that the species that we do know, they tend to be in uh, Asia and they tend to be in Australia. Those are the ones that have been studied most. We don't know much about North American species beyond our periodical cicadas. Um, and their life cycles vary quite a bit, anywhere from 1 to 19. Um, and. Uh, but there's a lot of variation in terms of that, depending on what they're feeding on um, or other things like that. Um, and some of this information, when I actually looked back at some of these publications, they're, they're not as a uh, metho, metho, yeah. Uh, they, they don't have the greatest of science. Some of it's just word of mouth, like, oh, we saw these 19 years ago and we're seeing them again, right? And maybe they missed a previous year, right? So, so some of this is, is still really unknown. And I'm interested in these North American species. Um, 
And why am I interested in cicadas? So cicadas are a really um, important um, aspect of ecosystems. So they play a large role in nutrient cycling. So they're spending all that time underground feeding on plant roots. And when they come above ground, you can think about cicadas as being pretty large compared to most insects, right? They're a large meal. So they're taking this really low nutrient um, food source and turning it into some really large biomass, which is really important for things that might eat them, right? So um, things that might eat them, um, I've seen a lot of birds eating cicadas. Um, uh, I once had a kingbird. I was, I was releasing one of my cicadas, a kingbird, swooped down, grabbed it, um, <laughs> as it was screaming <laughs> and bashed it into, against an electrical line until it stopped. <laughs> um, so birds love them. They're a great big meal. Small mammals underground, they do eat some of these um, cicada nymphs that are living underground. Um, copperheads, so snakes, do eat cicadas. Um, I was reading a news article from Texas that said that um, don't go to the parks at 7 or 8 o'clock at night because it's dangerous because all the copperheads are out at the park circling the trees waiting for the cicadas to come out of the ground. <laughs> um, so they know where to look. Um, and we actually have a paper um, where we looked at um, fecundity, so how many, leg, how many eggs um, copperheads are, are, were laying after a, a huge drought. Um, and it turns out that it looks like uh, periodical cicada emergence kind of helped buffer the losses that were um, incurred because of that drought. Um, because it is such a, I mean, like, they, they have some pictures of um, snakes that, it, that they dissected maybe a hundred years ago, where they cut them open and it's just, they're packed full of magic cicadas. So they're just completely full of these cicadas. Um, so they're a huge food source for, for many organisms, fish, um, spiders, other insects, and sometimes humans. There are some Native Americans that do eat cicadas. Um, and then also bacteria and fungi. So when you get these huge periodical cicada emergences, um, all of the predators are full, right? And so there's a bunch of cicadas left over. They just die and fall and decompose on the forest floor. And what they've shown is that there's an increase in woody biomass in um, subsequent years. So that, um, so those cicadas are breaking down and feeding the soil and feeding the plants. Um, and also, cicadas for me are important because it's the sound of summer. Um, it really is. Uh, I'm from California where we have more species than there are here. Um, there's about 50 plus species of cicadas in, Illinois, or, uh, cicadas in California. But when I moved here, I got here on October, August 1st. And when I stepped out of the car, it was deafening and I was like, what is this? Like, it was like an alien landscape to me. So um, it, it, it really, from the start, fascinated me. Um, and so let's talk about the different cicadas we find. Um, so I kind of group them into some not very uh, taxonomically correct categories, but they're fun. Um, these are the big guys. So the megatibicins, so giant cicadas. Um, and this one is called Megatibison oledes, and you should rec recognize this. I, I think that Joanne mentioned that she recognized this from going back to school time. Um, and so let's see how this sound is going to work for us. <laughs> um, but first, uh, these are where this species is found. So sometimes this is called the giant dusk singing cicada. Um, it's associated with oak trees. Um, for sure, you can definitely find them around um, oak trees. Um, and they're so large, they're the largest species of cicada we have in Illinois, and they're so large that if you go into the insect collection and you look through the pin specimens, sometimes you find just molts. And so the molts are large enough that you can identify which cicada it came from just by its sheer size. So that's how large they are. Um, and there's definitely some records hit missing here. I know they're in Monroe County, but I don't have a specimen to say that they're there. Um, so let's see if we can get the sound to work and if, if I have to use my, my phone. So, kind of soft. It takes a while to amp up. Can you guys hear that in the back? Okay, good. Does anybody recognize that? 
Yeah, good. Um, in, in some places in the U.S., they are actually listed um, as a species of conservation need. So um, hopefully they can stay off the list here. Um, okay, and then this is the species that I spend the most time working on. This is the Grand Prairie Cicada. Um, sometimes I just call it Dorsatus because of its uh, species name. Um, and this oviposits in gray-headed coneflower. Um, and some other species as well, but that's the one that I primarily see it laying its eggs in. Um, it's typically only found in high-quality remnant prairies, um, but you do see it a little bit more frequently south of Effingham. Um, and so, let's see, this one we might, can you hear that in the back? Anybody recognize that one? I heard it once at Lotus Prairie. Yep. Yes, this one is incredibly numerous at Loda Prairie. Um, but it's found in a few other places around the state. Um, but what you might notice here is if you look at its range map, um, Illinois is the only state east of the Mississippi where you can find it, so it's typically more central in the U.S. Um, and it has, you know, a decent distribution across the, the, um, the state, but you'll notice I haven't found it anywhere else. And I think that's because it's so large, so easy to find in prairies, um, we know where it is. Um, but one thing to note about its distribution is that it follows these railroad prairies. So these railroad prairies are very important for this species. Um, and I spend a lot of time on the side of the road um, looking for these guys. Um, or a lot of time in my car driving as, you know, slow and annoying all the other drivers with my window down, like listening to see if they're there. Um, and so they're along US 45, the right-of-way prairie, so right along, Cham you know, near Champaign, north of Champaign. Um, and they're also, uh, you know, stretching from Effingham down to Salem um, along the 12-mile uh, prairie. Um, and, you know, scattered a few other places around the state, and these are the places where I've collected them um, from around the state. Um, and so, yes, I spend a lot of time on these um, sides of the road. I wear my yellow or my orange vest and, you know, go out there with a net and people honk at me and wonder what I'm doing. Um, but it's a really great place to find them. Um, unfortunately, we have a lot of woody, you know, growth encroaching on these, you know, habitats. Um, and so how they, they really need to start getting managed a lot more. Um, but that's up to the Department of Transportation. Um, the other place that I do find them a lot of times is in cemetery prairies. Um, so um, you mentioned Loda Cemetery Prairie. That's one of the densest populations of them I've ever seen. Um, but also some of the other surrounding cemetery prairies. And the reason for both finding them in these railroad prairies and in cemetery prairies is that soil disturbance matters so much. Um, you can restore a prairie, but if the soil has been disturbed, a lot of these species just don't return. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you can hear that, but that's the cicada on top of the cage just calling um, right next to that cemetery. Um, all right. Uh, we did walkers, right? Or no, not yet. No, yeah. All right, no, we didn't do walkers. All right. Um, this is walkers cicada. <coughs> can you hear that in the back? It's a little harder. This one is definitely around here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it it kind of reminds me of like electrical line. Um, they're gorgeous. Um, I really think they're one of the more, most beautiful ones. Um, and they tend to be associated with more moist environments. Um, I see them a lot around willows, but I've also seen them elsewhere as well. Um, and I have, a few, I have a few records I need to add in here, like Sand Sangamon County is a new record for me. And, I just need to find a specimen for <laughs> um, Monroe. I know they're here. Um, but because they're calling from 30 feet up in a tree, it's hard to get them sometimes. OK, and so now we're getting to some of the new cicada records that we have um, from, from Illinois. So this is my next group. These are the dog day cicadas. So these are the smaller guys. Um, but these are the ones that call during the warmest months of the summer, right? And so we have uh, six different species, um, and you'll see some of them look pretty similar. 
Um, and I'll go over some of the, the differences um, in these. But one of the characters that you can use is this smoky Z pattern on their wing to identify them. All right, so the reason why these two are really difficult to tell apart um, is because I'm going to play the call, and hopefully you can hear both of these in the back. Takes a while. There it goes. Anybody recognize that one? No. Joanne does. <laughs> but it sounds a lot like another species that we have in northern Illinois. Can anyone tell the difference? This is a little higher. So those are the two species that we have. And if you look at an audio um, a spectrogram, it looks pretty similar. Um, and so I'm cautious. I didn't want to say when I found this, um, I was actually going to take down a recorder. I was like, oh, no, you know, like it's the end of the season. I'm going to go take the recorder down. Um, but then I heard this. And I was like, how have I missed this species, you know, after being here for, I mean, I think that was my third year there um, at Fultz Hill Prairie. And so I collected a few individuals and I left my recorder up for longer. Um, and I brought them back to try to figure out if I could tell the difference between these two species and make sure that this was um, what I thought it was. There's another species that is also a possibility, um, Neotibus and Davisi. Um, and so I really wanted to be certain that what I was hearing was something new. Um, and if you look at them, they're a little different. Like this one has a little bit lighter of a coloration, but color isn't a great character for cicadas because when you pin them, they lose that coloration pretty quickly. Um, and so the, the body shape was very similar. The size was very similar. Um, and so I decided to check the genetics. Um, and so when we check genetics, we just take a single lead clipping um, and uh, extract the DNA from that. And then we're able to look at what we call the barcode region. So that's the um, CO1 region um, to see um, what species, uh, you know, the online databases might say that this is. Um, and so when I did that, we got a an over 99% over match to Neotibicin auriferous. Now you'll see Davisi is a pretty close match as well. Um, we actually think that Neotibicin Davisi harnetti is um, a subspecies of auriferous, not of Davisi. So um, that's possibly why it's such a close match. But it definitely was a plains dog day cicada, the Neotibicin auriferous. Um, the other thing um, which uh, was really interesting was um, one unique thing about auriferous is that unlike canicularis and many of the other dog day cicadas, it lays its eggs in, egg, um, in grass stems, um, which is very unique for, for cicadas. Um, and so uh, again, Beamer to the rescue, he uh, documented that this species lays its egg in eggs in hollow stems of grass. Um, and we did uh, see this in Eagle Prairie um, at Illinois Ozarks in 2019. So um, that absolutely confirmed the identity for me. Um, and so this is a new state record. Um, and uh, since then, I've been trying to find it elsewhere to see how large this distribution might be. So we have it um, as far north as Olin uh, Nature Preserve. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that area um, in Madison County. And so they're in a very small clifftop prairie um, up there. Um, but they're also down here in Monroe County at Salt Lake, Illinois Ozarks, and Fultz Hill Prairie. Um, I'm still looking, so if anybody hears them, it's a pretty distinctive call for down here. Please let me know. Um, because I'm really interested to see if we can figure out their full range in the, down in here in southern Illinois. Um, and so along those lines, uh, this is really hard to see, but um, their range is mostly in uh, Missouri and a little bit far further um, into Oklahoma um, and Kansas, um, but they haven't been documented in, in Illinois till just now. Um, and so, and there's a few populations in northern 
Texas, but I'm hoping to get some more samples so that I can actually look at the population genetics of this species to try to figure out um, the size of these populations and if these populations are connected to each other, right? How sensitive are these populations? Do we have to worry about really preserving some of these landscapes? Um, and also how long have they been separated from populations in Missouri? Um, I was able to get over to Missouri and collect a couple individuals a couple years ago, but I still need to go back and, and find some more um, to really expand my data set. All right, and then back to, to Canicularis. So you heard the call of this guy. Um, so they tend to be further north. Now, if you've ever um, watched the show Schitt's Creek, um, uh, I always hear them in the background because they are up here in Canada. <laughs> so um, you can sometimes, uh, when you're watching these TV shows, I'll be listening, I'll be like, this is not filmed where they say it's filmed. I can hear the cicada. <laughs> Um, and so, uh, Canicularis is one of those ones that really stands out to me. Um, Prunosis um, is one of the most common that we find in this area, um, and it stretches throughout the state. Um, it's probably everywhere in the state. Um, yep, very common, um, has a wide range. Um, and this is called the Eastern Scissor Grinder Cicada. Um, it looks very similar to this other cicada called Neotibicin lineae, which is Lynn cicada. Um, supposedly, there's a bend in the wing here that makes it absolutely easy to tell them apart. Um, but you can see they're also found throughout the state. Um, and I found that there's a lot of uh, variation that we see within these two species that kind of makes them overlap in terms of the, the things that we would normally use to tell them apart, except for their call. So their call is very distinctive compared to prunosis. It takes a second. Sound a little bit familiar? Can you hear that one in the back? So they look almost entirely identical, um, but the calls are different. All right, and then this is one of the uh, uh, you know, really beautiful cicada called uh, the Lyric Cicada, another dog day cicada, and you can tell by this black band that goes across. It's called the pronotal, pronotal collar. Um, and it has a pretty wide range throughout the state as well. Kind of a metallic grinding sound. I hear these, I hear those across the street from my house every day, and I've never caught one by my house. <laughs> so yeah, they're tough. Um, this is, um, I like to refer this, to, refer to this species as the swamp cicada. Um, but some people call it, uh, let's see, the, the dawn or dawn, dawn cicada because it calls earlier in the day. Um, it also has a black pronotal collar, but the, um, the coverings over the operculum, over the, the noise producing organs are really bizarre and long. So they're pretty easy to tell apart from that previous species, the lyric cicada. I think I, I did, that was not the right song. Let me play the right song. Because <laughs> they definitely sound very different than that. All right, Neo Tibison. See, it's good, I have my phone right here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I love this swamp button. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that's the swamp cicada. So you can tell all of these species have very different calls, right? Um, so it's kind of like bird watching. If you like, you know, listening to birds and trying to identify the different species, cicadas can be similar. Um, all right, next to what I like to call the itty bitties. Um, and they're not all that small, but most of them are pretty small. So this is a 1.5 mil tube. Um, I guess as a scientist, I know what that looks like, but you know, they're pretty small, right? Um, and so these guys are pretty tiny. You can see down here, this is a centimeter scale bar. So very small cicadas. Um, this is the southern grass cicada. Um, 
I call it Cicadetta or Cicadetana. Um, it's on the Illinois Wildlife Action Plan because it is, you know, pre-restricted in its um, distribution. It's active earlier in the year than a lot of other cicadas. Um, and it has a four-year life cycle, which Beamer um, worked really hard to, to, you know, figure out by rearing these guys for four years um, to, to see how long it took them to get to adulthood. Now, these ones, I can still hear out of one ear and not the other. Um, so I'm going to play it, and you're, yeah, you may not be able to hear it. I may not be able to hear it. We'll see. Who can hear it? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very faint, right? It's really up there in the kilohertz, so it's almost, um, it is ultrasonic, right? Like a bat, right? Um, but we, we brought it down to uh, lower frequency so that hopefully people can hear it. Can you hear that now? Still, you know, a little bit high in frequency. Um, right? It's, it's hard to hear. Um, and so when I bring my technicians in the field to try to find these guys, sometimes they can't hear them. And, um, you know, they're 19 or 20 years old. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they're tough, and that means they're really difficult to find as well. And so I think that they may have a more wide distribution than we really know, right? Because I keep finding them um, in places that they haven't been documented before. But they still do really, um, they really are found in more high quality prairies, um, in those roadside prairies, in those uh, uh, cemetery prairies. Um, in nature preserves, and so they, they do follow a similar um, range map to like uh, the prairie cicada, the grand prairie cicada. Um, and so unless you know what you're looking for, these are really hard to find. Um, and one thing about these guys is um, I found this note from um, a researcher at the Illinois Natural History Survey um, Milton Sanderson. He's also well known for collecting amber. Um, <laughs> He uh, was a field biologist um, at the Illinois Natural History Survey, and he wrote this in 1956. Um, and he found these cicadas um, on June 27th, um, three miles south on a hill prairie of Valmeyer, Illinois. And when I ma map that out um, on a map, that puts us at, I think, White Rock. Does that sound about right? Yeah. Um, and so he just wrote small cicada. So we actually had to go into the collection, pull his specimen, and we were able to find that it was um, this small grass cicada. And since then, um, we've actually found uh, this species at uh, Fultz Hill Prairie, Olin Prairie. I don't think we've looked yet at your prairie, Joanne, um, but we'll have to come back. Um, and part of the reason that we haven't found it is because we haven't been coming out early enough. Um, and so we have records from uh, June 11th, um, and so a little bit earlier than when Milton found it in the 50s. Um, and so I've been setting up my recorders um, earlier now so that we can track when they're coming out to see if the timing has shifted and how it compares to northern Illinois. Because it does seem like these ranges, you know, or these uh, dates of emergence do vary across the state. Um, and so I thought that was really interesting. Um, another one of, it's a little bit of an itty bitty, it's a little larger for the itty bitties, but this is Deceroprocta vitropenis. This is a green scrub cicada, and it's very sporadic throughout the state. Um, it typically seems to be found in um, sand prairies. Um, and so it's active from mid-June to mid-July, um, and I like to say that it sounds like a sprinkler on a hot summer day. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> From a distance. When you get close to it, the sound is like completely different. And so these are at um, Gleason um, Nature Preserve up near Sand Ridge. Um, I've also found them in, um, like, down in Fort Defiance State Park. So they, they have a pretty large range all the way up to, to Chicago as well. And this one is a cicada that I tell all of my field techs, if you catch one of these for me, I will buy you a steak dinner because 
This cicada I've never caught personally, um, but I hear it all the time. So this is the hieroglyphic cicada. Um, and let's play that call. Anybody recognize that one? It's at Fultz. Um, and I just heard it um, yesterday. So they're there. I just can never catch them. Um, and so uh, one of these days, one of these days I will find them. <laughs> Um, and then uh, another new find, so this is another one of our state, new state records. Um, this is Bomeria venosa. Um, they're really tiny. This is a penny for scale, so you can see they're very tiny little guys. They're adorable. Um, at least I think so. Um, <laughs> and uh, their call might also be a little difficult to hear, so let's see. Can anybody hear that? Yeah, I don't, I don't think playing it on the speaker is going to help. Um, so very tiny little guys, and typically the smaller the cicada, um, the more high in frequency their call is. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why you probably, it's hard to hear that one. Um, and I did double check the genetics of this because it hadn't been reported before, and we have a 99% match to a Bumeria venosa um, record in the online databases for that CO1 region. Um, and so it's pretty certain that that's the species. Um, but one thing I noted um, on uh, GenBank was that there's only one species of Vimeria in there. So not everything's been sequenced. And that's a, a real push that we have as um, geneticists that we need to sequence all the species. We need barcodes for every single organism that's out there, right? Um, especially ones that are as common as some of these other Vimeria species are. And it's really not that hard to sequence these, these individuals and get their sequences put online. Um, their range is, is pretty interesting because they're mostly down in the southwest. And so the fact that we have them in Illinois is fascinating to me. And it's possible that maybe um, we might have some subspecies. Um, and so I've been collecting these guys and I've got some samples um, from Texas. Um, I haven't been able to find them in Missouri yet, but I have some leads. Um, and if we look at where they are in Illinois that I found so far, um, it's mostly these same clifftop prairies in Monroe County. So I, I was not able to find them at Olin Nature Pres Preserve. Um, so they're at Salt Lick, they're at Fultz, they're at Illinois Ozarks, um, and we're still looking. Um, they're, they're also hard to find, and the timing is a little bit more sensitive for them. You have to be out at the right time to find them. Um, but, like Joanne said, when you find them, there's lots of them, right? Um, so they're doing well. They tend, we tend to find them around scurfy peat. Um, and I found some oviposition scars on a scurfy peat, so they've been laying eggs in it. Um, it's possible they have other hosts as well, but maybe, maybe that, um, that plant is restricting them from from uh, moving into other areas. All right, and then the last group is um, the proto-periodical cicadas and the periodical cicadas. Um, and so I'll talk first about um, these proto-periodical cicadas, meaning like they may be kind of periodical or starting to be periodical, but they're not quite there. So they don't emerge on a very set schedule. They kind of have some buffer wiggle room. So Okanaganabali, um, ha, does anybody familiar with Weston Cemetery Prairie? Has anybody been up there? It's kind of, it's kind of in the middle of the state. So it's in McLean County. Um, it's near Chenoa, um, <laughs> but uh, it's a small, small prairie, um, cemetery prairie. Um, and I started finding these molts on the ground one year, um, and I thought. What cicada is this size in this prairie? Because I'm not seeing anything, I'm not hearing anything, and it's not like they have many places to hide because it's such a small cemetery prairie. I knew that we had one of our itty bitties, um, the small grass cicada, Cicadetan, but I wasn't sure what this big guy was. And so I kept looking, we went back many, many times trying to find the cicada and were very unsuccess unsuccessful that year. Um, even though, looking at the date now, I was going at the right time. Um, and so I brought this molt back, 
Um, and I extracted DNA and tried to amplify it, but it's tricky with this group. Um, and so finally, I went up to the Field Museum and I pulled some of this, the samples that they have there because people had deposited some molts. And I was able to use the morphology on this molt to say, okay, I know it's in this genus. So I know it's an Oconagana, which is really, really rare. Um, and so this is what the cemetery prairie looks like. Um, and this is Oconagana Bali. So I went back the following year and I found those adults. And what was really weird was that they were calling from the base of plants. Now most cicadas will go up to the top of the plant just to call. Because, you know, you'd think like that's the better place to get the girls to come to you, right? No, nope. these guys were calling from underneath some clover on the ground. They were in the parking lot. Um, which then I had to make recommendations for the group that manages this, please don't mow the parking lots in July, right? Because this is when these guys are out and they're laying eggs. Um, and so we really got to be careful that we're not disturbing this very, very rare um, population of cicadas um, because they are only found um, in a few counties. So this is this new record. Um, so pretty far south for this species. Um, and while these are in gray saying that they're there, um, only one known population exists in northern Illinois right now um, in this space. So we have two populations now. I still need to double check some railroad prairies here, um, but we haven't found them anywhere else. So this is a very sensitive population and I'm going to keep continuing to look for them now that I kind of have a better idea how to find them. Um, but they like to call from um, the base of plants, which makes things difficult, and also they're very sensitive about when they call. They need a really bright, sunny day to actually call. Otherwise, they just won't make a peep. Um, so they're very difficult to find, very rare. Um, I was really proud to find them. And then this species I still have never seen in Illinois. Um, the last record that we have was be from before 1962, and the reason I say from before 1962 is because somebody checked out that specimen from the insect collection and hasn't brought it back, but he checked it out in 1962. <laughs> so it's gotta be from before then. Um, and they're in the far northern part of the state, and they sound similar. It sounds like a Katie did, though, to me, which means that they're really hard to define. All right, and then finally on to our periodical cicadas. So the periodical cicadas are the ones that come out every 17 or 13 years. Um, and what uh, a lot of people don't know is when you have those emergences, there's actually multiple species within um, that brood emergence. And so each of these species has a different call. Um, I'm gonna play at least one of them for you. They sound very different than the other cicadas, don't they? They don't have covers on their timbles, so they don't have those operculums, so that's maybe one of the reasons that they sound a little different. They, they have very different morphology. They're very, um, they're very unrelated to a lot of the species I've covered so far today. Um, and so uh, these, these species all have different calls, um, and they uh, exist in different broods. And so in Illinois, we have five distinct broods. Now a brood is a group of cicadas that emerges across a range of a, a, an area of land. So I'm sure, I'm sure some of you have heard the story last year of brood X, right? Does that sound familiar? When brood X emerged in the eastern part of the state, 2021, that was a 17 year brood. So, um, they emerge 17 years before that, and they'll emerge again in 2038. So it's going to be a while. Um, but we have all these different broods, and one thing to point out is we've got two 2024s coming out. So we've got brood 13 and brood 19 coming out the same year. 
um, which I'm so excited for. And I think that also, isn't there an eclipse that year too? Yeah, 2024, yeah. Yeah, so it's going to be a fun year. I'm excited. I, I was living in Nashville, Tennessee uh -huh. when the 17 and 13 year came out. Mm -hmm. um, and they cover everything. Yeah. It's crazy. They're shutting down flights. Yeah, it's it's incredible the sheer biomass. Now this is called like a pulsed resource, right? Because when these guys come out, they're coming out in such huge numbers, presumably so that all the predators, all the birds and mammals that eat them get full, right? And there's still yeah. plenty left over. Oh, yeah, you're yeah. seeing them everywhere on the ground still. Mm -hmm. And then the trees that would cover the entire tree. And it's it stinky. It's crazy. <laughs> it's so stinky when they all die. Yeah, it was. You can smell it on the road. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Driving in a car. It was crazy. In fact, I kept a newspaper where it was on the cover mm -hmm. that they were coming out, um, and it was it was amazing. Yeah, it was so amazing. So I, the I, number, I sheer number and how loud. Yeah, they amplified. And what's it's funny crazy. is if you compare their volume to a lot of these dog day cicadas, <clears throat> individually they're a lot quieter. Um, but when you get them all together, Colin, it's so loud. It was ear piercing. Yes. So loud. Yes. It was really the neatest thing I've ever saw, but man, it, it was amazing. I mean, it is a wonder of the world. Yeah, it like, was. When you it's, see this happen. It was big news in Nashville. I mean, it's on the, for several weeks, it was on the cover of the newspaper and stuff like that. Yeah, and, and it's been great for me because now I get to go online and buy all of the cicada-related gear. That <laughs> 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 I just have so much cicada stuff. I love it. Um, and so, and it was a great time to uh, talk to news agencies and you know get all this word out about how cool this really is. It is. People people get annoyed, um, <laughs> but and the only the only real damage that I've heard that they do is they do damage orchards, right? Because right. when they oviposit, if they're ovipositing um, on some of the younger fruit trees, it can do enough damage that you know you can kill off a young tree. Um, and you, you know, people say, oh, we'll just, you know, like kill them with insecticides. Well, that doesn't really work, right? Because, if, I mean, you'd have to get it like right on the egg nest, right? Because if you're killing the adults, there's still going to be more adults coming in and laying eggs, and then they're underground. And so um, I, the best way that I personally think to, to manage for these losses is to just net trees, you know, just throw a net over a tree and they can't get in and lay their eggs. Well, I think if you're going to have an orchard, maybe not plant in the years or around the years. <laughs> right, yeah, trees. just you know, think a little bit ahead, right? Yeah, just cut it down. Um, or buy less insurance. Yes, yes. <laughs> with um, the sound, with the two competing types, do mm -hmm. they try to outdo each other? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. And so one thing I started noticing with Brood X was that um, in the beginning part of the the emergence you hear one species and then as it gets later in the emergence you hear other species and so they're timing themselves in terms of like the dates when they come out so that they don't compete as much um, but then the other thing is they're not just competing um, uh, temporally they're competing underground so if you look at these maps you'll see like the lines go right up to each other and so underground they are kind of Facing themselves out, but competing with each other as well. And so you don't get two broods overlapping in an area. There's what do you think? How do you think they get that chemistry? I don't know. Um, I mean, I think it's just sheer numbers, right? Um, if you're all merging at the same time, yeah. yeah I don't know. It's a good question. They're, I mean, like if you dig them up, supposedly they're spaced out. I mean, I can't confirm that because I have not had luck digging them up. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, they're, they're all spaced out. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many cool questions. And you know, I'm looking forward to 2024 because um, there are some researchers who, um, in a previous year where there were two broods emerging at the same time, a 13 year and a 17 year, they were able to get them to mate. Um, so like if we go back, let me go back. Um, if you go back and you look at these different names, you see, uh, let's see, we've got Neo, uh, sorry, Magicicata cassinii, and then we've got Magicicata neotrade cassinii. So those two are actually um, really closely related. 
and they're able to mate. But what do they produce? Do they produce eggs that are going to be 13 year or 17 year? Or some of be 15. Yeah, and so I know. Yeah, yeah I know. Average it out. Right, right. And so they're, but they're still waiting on the results of that because it takes a long time. Um, and so they, yeah, they, they mated them, they put them in their garden, and now they're just waiting to see how many come up every year. It's, it's, there's so many cool questions here, but it takes a long time to study these guys. A really long time. Um, and if you miss a year because of COVID, uh, it sucks. Um, because, uh, for example, uh, let's see. Um, so we've got the brood 13 coming out in Chicagoland in 2024. Well, one thing about these cicadas is that they're not the best at keeping track of time. And so you get early emergence, so early birds, and you get some stragglers. And so I was up in Chicago in 2020 um, to try to document how many cicadas we were seeing in Chicago, because we saw a decent number. Um, but actually, I will say that brood X, I saw a lot more stragglers. So I went to Indianapolis um, in 2017, and there were so many on, um, what is it, uh, one of the Indiana University campuses. Um, it was incredible. Like, I, I don't, you know, that, that many stragglers, what they're probably doing, what's going to happen is they're setting up a new brood. And so this is how we get broods popping in and out of existence. Because if enough individuals are, you know, emerge early and aren't all eaten by predators, then they can reproduce, lay eggs, and set up more for the next time. So um, while we have lost some broods over the past few decades, like we are actually maybe getting some new broods as well. Is that how we could get some subspecies out of some of these? Where they Reproducing. I mean, I think it's just setting up of new broods in this case. But, you know, how, what's going to happen with these 13 and 17 years? Are they going to overlap? Are they going to set up some weird hybrid? I don't know. I mean, it's not the only time this has happened, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, I don't know if I have time for this next section. It's 155, so just keep how going. Do you think it'll be? I don't know. Oh, okay. Keep going? All right, let's keep going. All right. <laughs> somebody has to leave? Go ahead. Yeah, exactly. Otherwise, we're at your back and All right, so as we all know, Illinois has a very fragmented landscape. And so this is all kind of new early stuff. So um, keep that in mind. This is very um, new work that I've been, been doing. Um, and so, you know, it's a very fragmented landscape. We have less than 0.07% of original prairie in Illinois. And I'm sure you've heard these numbers before, but when you think about the fact that cicadas need that undisturbed soil, right, for these species to persist in these environments, even if we restore prairies, we have to be really, you know, we have to really understand why are they not moving into these new restored prairies effectively. Um, and so I have been looking at how these populations are connected on the landscape, um, I'm also really interested in how long they spend underground um, and how does this impact how we can get them to recolonize these prairies. Um, and so I've been going out um, and clipping legs of cicadas. Um, I like to say they have five more. Um, <laughs> so I, I clip and release and then I have a, a DNA sample that can do quite a lot of, uh, for me. Um, so one of the first things I do is I check my CO1, so I check my barcode. and what we're looking for is um, nucleotides that are different um, between these individuals so that we can get an idea of how um, different different populations are. Um, and this is not much different, right? This is not enough to really use for me to understand how these populations might be different. That's not enough what we call single, single nucleotide polymorphism, SNPs. And cicadas, of course, have to be complicated. Um, they also have this weird thing called NUMPS, where some of their um, DNA from their mitochondrial genome moves into their nuclear genome and then makes it a mess to sequence. So just makes things complicated. Even cicada researchers who have been doing this for decades, have designed all these primers, they still have trouble with it. Um, microsatellites is another option that has been used for many decades. Um, but that means that somebody else has to have done the work for me, and so I, we still don't have enough quite there. 
So what I've been doing is um, next generation sequencing. So that's where you get all the genetic information, right? You pay a little bit more money, um, but it's less man hours. So what I do is say we have um, a genome. We have a long stretch of DNA. Now what we're going to do is we take that long stretch of DNA and we cut it at specific spots. So if there's an ATG here, I want to cut that spot right there, right? Um, and we do that for every single individual. We cut them up, cut their genome up into these, these pieces. And what ends up happening is we get SNPs. So we get lots and lots and lots of information out of um, a very small amount of DNA. Um, and it allows me to not hurt these populations, right? I'm only taking a leg releasing them. I've seen these cicadas sing after I release them. I've seen them lay eggs after I release them. I've seen them mate after I release them. So maybe their fitness is a little lower because they have one less leg, but um, they're still doing a lot um, that they were doing before. Um, so I had to double check that make, to make sure that these enzymes would actually cut cicada DNA because cicadas are complicated again because they have giant genomes, like way larger than our genome. Um, so much bigger, um, and so I cut up that DNA, and this is what you want to see. You want to see these nice smears. Um, so this is the genomic DNA, a big piece of DNA, and then this means that it's been fragmented into tiny little pieces. And I tested for four different species. It works. Um, and so my pilot study um, was with these guys, my favorite, the Grand Prairie Cicada. Um, and I got so much information, it's ridiculous, like, I have to get new hard drives to fill up all of these terabytes of data um, that I'm getting from this, which is fantastic. It's actually more than I can really handle because it, when I need to do an analysis, sometimes it takes me a week for that analysis to complete, so my computer is just working overtime. Um, but I was able to do over 400 individuals um, with tons and tons of genetic information for each of these individuals. Lots, so instead of working with that, that CO1 barcode region where I had maybe five regions where um, they differed among individuals, right, but where one base pair differed among individuals, now I've got over two million different differences among individuals so I can compare these populations. And so these are all the places that I collected across the state for this species. Um, and somebody was like, well, why didn't you collect, you know, like at set distances from the railroad? Well, this is the only place where these populations exist. So this is as best as I could design this study. Um, and this is what it looks like, kind of messy, right? Um, so when I, when I try to um, put this into a structure plot, this is called a structure plot, each of these numbers is a potential different population. Now you can see some of these populations, they look very similar in terms of um, the color which has to do with the number of SNPs that they share. Um, so purple means, you know, so you can see all these guys are purple, that probably means they're from the same place or from the same population. So let's say we have, um, in this case, we have a cemetery prairie that's right next to a railroad prairie. Now look, you can see this one's blue this one's blue, that means that those populations are effectively the same population, right? We see that there's a little bit of gene flow happening, right, from some other populations nearby. So there's some cicadas moving, you know, coming and going. Um, but in general, our cicadas from, in this case, uh, the south of Paxton right away, right away Prairie and Prospect Cemetery Prairie are effectively the same population. Whereas here, Lota Cemetery Prairie, um, we've got this, uh, green color, um, and south of Buckley right away prairie, um, they're distinctive. So this one's a, a railroad prairie and this one's a cemetery prairie that's um, a decently close. But if we look at the distances between these, we can start to see why there's this pattern. So there's only two kilometers of distance between these populations where we collected individuals. So that's why you might see that they're the same color, right? <coughs> um, they have the same uh, you know, polymorphism, so they have the same SNPs, those same base pairs in those same positions. Um, whereas here, unfortunately, it was about 6.5 kilometers, so that was enough to make those populations distinct. Um, now, I've seen these cicadas fly, and I've seen them fly far, um, so I worry a little bit that maybe they're getting caught in these cornfields, you know, that they're not able to really uh, fly between these two prairies. 
Um, and you can see, you know, there's, there's quite a bit of distance between these as well. But we're not really getting much uh, gene flow between these populations, um, unlike what we're seeing with this right-of-way prairie and this cemetery prairie that's pretty close. You know, the other questions um, that I'm, I'm looking into while I anal analyze this data is, how much does it matter what's in between these populations, right? So you've got a, a cemetery prairie and you've got a railroad prairie. What happens if there's a, um, a residential area in between? Is that good? Does, you know, are they able to move across that landscape? Um, versus, you know, if it's industry, if it's, uh, um, you know, agriculture, what, what might be impeding some of the flow that we would hope to see between some of these cemetery prairies and some of these right-of-way prairies? Because ideally, we want a contiguous landscape, right? We want these cicadas to be able to move across this landscape. So if we do lose one of these prairies, you know, there's still, you know, a way for them to flow between them. Because um, I can tell you, this prairie, south of Paxton, right away prairie, I've been going there since 2015, and it's gotten so bad. The sumac is just crowding out everything. Um, you know, there's very little of the host plant that they use left, um, and it's looking really bad. Um, one thing about this prairie um, was uh, there, there's a, a high school teacher that was, was going here. He's trying to reintroduce some cicadas, some of these cicadas, into a nearby prairie. Um, and he was out here collecting some cicadas to bring to his prairie. Um, and this is, this is a pretty high quality prairie for a railroad prairie. And he said the reason for that is because there's a farmer who when he takes his truck across the railroad tracks, he wants to be able to see. And so he's been spraying the trees, he's been spraying all the woody stuff to keep it down for decades. Now he's getting older, and so once he passes, this is probably going to go back to what, it, you know, you know, something like what uh, South of Paxton right away is like. So, you know, it's these little things that, you know, I, I had no idea that that was happening, but it's helped so much. That prairie looks so much, so much better than some of the surrounding prairies. Um, and so I've been doing um, collections, um, DNA collections on a number of species. So um, the data set um, that I'm working with right now is from 2015 to 2020. Um, I'm hoping to see some, some uh, patterns for uh, uh, life history patterns, right? So if, if for example, um, these guys spend five years underground, do we see that they are more related to the individuals from five years ago? versus the ones that are from four years ago. So do I see patterns that'll help me be able to understand how long these guys are underground? But that means that I'm collecting every year. Um, and so, you know, 20, I've been going from 2015 to 2022, so a long time. Um, I've been doing the same with Cicadetana calliope fly because remember Beamer has information saying that they are underground for four years. So if I can prove that that works for this species, um, then I can prove, prove my concept that maybe it'll work for other species as well. Four years is a lot longer, or a lot less time to wait than I'm starting to think that these guys spend underground. I'm starting to think that these guys spend at least five years underground, um, maybe up to ten. Um, and I have no basis of saying that, <laughs> but they don't tend to move into prairies very easily. And so Lotus Cemetery Prairie, um, they've been expanding the prairie um, by adding in uh, restorations around it. And this species has not moved into those restorations that are directly adjacent. I've been going through and I've been looking for emergence holes, I've been looking for, for molts, and I'm just not seeing there, them there. The adults are moving in there. The adults are moving into the restored prairie. But the, there is no evidence that they're underground there. Um, so why is that the case? Is it just that they're still underground? You know, has it not been enough time since they added those restorations? And it, I, I don't, I don't remember when they've added those restorations, but it's been, it's been close to ten years, I think, um, maybe somewhere around there. Um, I'm also collecting uh, these new state records um, from multiple prairies in southern Illinois. So I'm collecting the legs of these guys. Um, but I need to expand outside of Illinois because I'm interested in when did these cicadas, you know, colonize these prairies? Were they once contiguous with the populations that were across the river um, in Missouri? Um, and same with these Bumeria finosa, these little itty bitties. Um, I've been collecting since 2019 for auriferous and 2018 with Bumeria. 
Um, and I do have some text and samples for these guys. Um, and that's it. So I'd like to thank everybody. <laughs> I've had quite a few field techs over the years. It's been great working with students and helping them grow and get into these awesome positions. So um, Natalie Mills right now, she's working for the Forest Service um, on owls um, on the West Coast. Um, uh, Kate, she, she started working with me from the beginning and she's now a science teacher. Um, she brought a lot of bugs into the classroom after, you know, working with me. She's been great. Um, and this is my little Julian. He's also a very good field tech for me. So, <laughs> um, with that, thank you guys. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Katie? Yeah. How long did they live after they get out of the ground? Um, so, I've been able to keep them alive anywhere from three to four weeks. Um, so, but, you know, there's predation that happens out there. Um, it's not totally certain how long they're alive. Without tracking them and putting tags on them, I don't know any other way of <laughs> figuring it out. Yeah? To, uh, feed on the xylem sap, got to stick their proboscis through the phone. Why don't they just stop there? I don't know. Sure. I mean, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, in the roots, like, is that the case, though? I don't know much about plant biology. Yeah, for woody plants, there's some deficiencies. Yeah, that, that would make more sense. But yeah, no. Some of us like saltier things. Yeah, they don't sweet the bosses. They don't sweet Yeah, that's a good question. I, I've, um, you know, I've talked to, to some botanists about, like, can we figure out what they're feeding on by looking at what's, you know, like, actually in their gut, um, you know, in terms of species, right? And so there's some information out there looking at um, isotopes. Um, and, it, it, you know, it appears that at least with um, the Grand Prairie cicada, they tend to feed on forbs, um, whereas the, the grass cicada actually does seem to feed on grasses. Um, but beyond that, I don't know, you know, like what species are they feeding on, and yeah, um, it'd be interesting to find out. So can we assume that restoration work doesn't necessarily really mean we can relocate and establish new populations? Yeah, I mean, it's, what it's, like. it's, you know, I've, I've heard tell, and I don't know if this is the case, Ballard Nature Center um, near Effingham, they may have been able to reestablish them there, but they're pretty ubiquitous throughout that area, you know, Effingham and further south. Um, so they may have just been there and nobody noticed. Um, I don't know. Um, I think that I have more high hopes for um, Cigadetana, the small grass cicada, moving into new areas, um, just based on some of the crummier spots I've been at before. Um, but they're easy to miss too, right? Like maybe they were there and nobody saw them. Dorsatus is not easy to miss. Like you can find them <laughs> if you need to find them. Um, so yeah, I don't know why they're not moving into these, you know, restorations. But you know, I'm hoping that it is just that it is going to take a long time. You know, that they're really just it's going to take a long time for them to establish underground. And then you need enough individuals coming above ground to not get eaten um, and reproduce and, you know, lay eggs. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a tough, you know. You know, and I'm also looking into the microbiome. Um, and there's some interesting pathogens out there. Um, uh, I don't know if anybody's familiar with cordyceps, but cordyceps is out there. Um, so they may also just, you know, all these different stressors, it's just too much. Do they pick up their gut, the symbionts from the soil? No, they're just like, it, it's passed maternally. Yeah. Um, and the idea is that those endosymbionts actually came from some sort of pathogen that was then co-opted into, you know, serving that other need. Yeah? Um, I live in the middle of the town. Um, with cicadas that have been around for a long time, would they move to a, a garden prairie? Um, would that attract them? I or mean, 
it depends on, on the species. Um, Prunosis seems to go anywhere. You know, the, the dog day cicadas, they tend to go everywhere. Um, so um, I think they will move in. You know, some of the dog days will definitely move in, but I don't know about the other guys. Some, some are very host specific, or at least seem to be host specific. But again, it's kind of a black box. Nobody's done the work um, to figure out if they lay eggs, will those eggs hatch, right? Like if they're host specific and you put the plant that they want in, um, maybe it'll work, but you know, it's worth a shot. I, I'm always like relocating cicadas into my yard to get a few more. <laughs> um, you know, like I, I tend to use red bud as a good one for pruinosis to try to get them to move in. And how many do you move together to? I mean, the females like will lay if they're you know if it's the end of the season and they've mated. The lay, okay. yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, that high school teacher, he's actually near Weston Cemetery Prairie, and he moved some to um, a prairie nearby, and he only had to move like a few females, and they just lay everywhere. When females are what we what we scientists call gravid, full of eggs. They will lay. I've had them just like explode with eggs in a cage before. Like there's just eggs everywhere. Um, so when they're ready to lay, they're ready to lay. And I think they lay enough egg nests that you know they should be fine. But there are parasitoids. So I've hatched out um, wasps instead of <laughs> cicadas before. Um, and so you know there are there are things out there that can you know harm them in really early stages. And that's one of the reasons that they think cicadas are underground for so long, is the real um, danger for cicadas is that egg to like burst and start nymph stage. That's when most of them die off. Like you can imagine they're tiny, they're losing water really easily, right? They, they are gonna desiccate, they're gonna get eaten, they're gonna you know, be parasitized as an egg. Um, and so that's when um, is the most worrisome time as a cicada, but once they're underground and they're feeding on a root, like they're safe, and so there's no reason to rush things. Um, that's the that's one of the hypotheses out there, um, and that's one of the reasons why they think they were underground. You know, they are underground for so long. Um, Have they seen any changes in the emergence with climate change? Dates? Yeah, um, I think so, but other people have proposed other hypotheses. So in 2018, I went out to New York for the Onondaga brood emergence, um, and that's one that used to spread from um, Syracuse all the way across the Great Lakes up into Buffalo. Um, and so that was a 17-year brood, right? Um, and they've been tracking it, like they've been monitoring all of these broods for many, many decades. Um, and they've been tracking that one for a really long time. And it just seems to have gotten smaller and smaller and smaller. And I think there's this, with those broods, there's this like sort of tipping point where you need enough individuals to lay enough eggs. And if you don't get there, you know, it, it's just the, the population is not sustainable. Um, and so, yeah, that, that brood, we looked, we looked everywhere for those individuals. And they're only around Syracuse and on the, uh, you know, Native American land that's the very small amount of it that's left south of Syracuse. Um, and, you know, we just weren't there. You know, there were some there, you know, 17 years before and more, way more there, you know, 17 years before that, but it's definitely um, decreased in its size. Um, and it's possible, you know, some, some cicada researchers say that that brood disappeared because it's at the northernmost range. Um, but, I mean, I think with climate change and with, um, you know, habitat usage, we're just going to see a lot of these declines, um, unfortunately. Um, and, you know, one other interesting thing that, that might happen is, so we have our 17-year broods and we have our 13-year broods. Now, the 13-year broods are further south, right? Um, and they think that's because of, you know, the warmth, right? And so as you go further north, it gets cooler, and that's why we have our 17 years. Are we going to see more 17 years out coming out early? You know, are we going to see more 13-year sort of cycles happening further north? Because um, I am seeing those, those, you know, broods that might be, or those, those early emergers that might be setting up a new brood.
Um, I checked for stragglers this year for the um, Brood X um, and didn't find any. So I'm not seeing them coming out late, but I was seeing them come out early. Any more questions? I also, I did bring some Neotibis and Auriferous, um, the guys from Fultz, which I was hoping they'd call, but it's a little too chilly in here. Um, and then I also brought uh, some pin specimens so you can see all the different spe species of cicadas that we have. Um, yeah, happy to stick around for a little longer and answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much.